In our discussion of methods for elucidating the structure of disaccharides, we saw that hemiacetals could be distinguished from acetals within disaccharides by a mild oxidation with aqueous bromine. The key idea was that hemiacetals are able to open to form aldehydes while acetals are not. This is useful to us because we can use mild oxidation to determine which of two anomeric positions is involved in a glycosidic linkage. But what happens if both anomeric positions are part of the glycosidic linkage in a disaccharide? Pause the video now and see if you can predict the results of treating sucrose, a 1-1 connected sugar, with aqueous bromine. In this situation, both anomeric positions are part of acetal functional groups, and there are no hemiacetals present in the molecule. This means that opening to form an oxidizable aldehyde is not possible. In fact, the only opening possible would produce an oxocarbenium ion, which is unlikely under these mild conditions. Consistent with this idea, when we treat a 1-1 connected disaccharide with aqueous bromine, no reaction occurs. The sugar and bromine can be recovered unchanged. Because this 1-1 connected sugar does not have the ability to reduce aqueous bromine to two HBr molecules, we call it non-reducing. Sugars containing a hemiacetal group are called reducing because as they are oxidized to carboxylic acids, they reduce Br2 and H2O to two molecules of HBr. Let's take a moment now to think about how polysaccharides form mechanistically. We've seen in a variety of contexts already that the anomeric carbon in cyclic monosaccharides is a good electrophile. Protonation of the anomeric OH group followed by beta elimination produces an electrophilic oxocarbenium ion. We've also seen that the hydroxyl groups on cyclic sugars are good nucleophiles. In fact, we saw that the acetal exchange reaction replaces the anomeric OH group with an OR group. And if R is another sugar molecule, we can recognize this process as the formation of a disaccharide from two monosaccharides. However, doing this without site selectivity could lead to the formation of a variety of products as a solution of two monosaccharides contains multiple nucleophiles and electrophiles. In the next webcast, we'll learn how glycosidic bond formation, the coupling of two monosaccharides, happens selectively in biological settings.